All right, next speaker then is uh, Stephen Goodman, who is Associate Dean for Clinical and Translational Research and Professor of Medicine and Health Research and Policy at Stanford uh, University School of Medicine. Dr. Goodman, are you with us? I am. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you got the floor. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I apologize for not being there. I know it's very, very different to hear a disembodied voice and to interact with a real person. Um, but uh, I'll just make a few uh, comments here. Um, just one second, um, and, uh, and and we'll see if they're they're helpful. I have to say at the top that this particular domain is not my area of expertise. Um, I spend time thinking about the interface between the ethics of clinical investigation and the design of clinical studies. Uh, and uh, the other qualification I have is I've sat on innumerable IOM panels where we're asked completely impossible questions to answer in a finite period of time. So I, I, I very much sympathize with the task of the uh, committee. Um, and I'm glad I don't have to answer definitively some of the questions that you uh, are, are faced with here. So I'll just make a few comments and, and I don't, we'll, we'll see how helpful they are. Um, one is that um, now usually we're dealing in the ethics of clinical research with uh, situations where the, the evaluation itself is the most ethically fraught um, uh, aspect. Um, when you're thinking about how to test the Ebola vaccine, uh, nobody's saying that, that the testing of the vaccine uh, it itself is, is, is ethically fraught, that, that trying it out. But of course, the design with which that you might use that might deprive it to some people is very ethically fraught. Here, of course, we have ethical questions about the technique itself, which in some ways dwarf the, um, some of the clinical research questions. Um, but I saw uh, there were several uh, questions posed, and um, what I find in debates like this about what kind of design should be used to assess the benefits and risk is these are almost always surrogates for what are the relevant questions. Um, and, and I get the sense that th those questions are constantly in flux here. So. The, the questions that one needs to ask have to be defined very, very crisply in terms of obviously the patients in which the inter these interventions are going to be done, what exactly the intervention is, comparison, the outcomes, and, and the time frame. And those have to be uh, specified first before we can talk about designs. So as the committee goes forward, I, I would encourage them to outline what all the questions are, or as many questions as they can think. And then with respect to each one, we can talk about different designs. But it's very confusing and, and often it, it's very unsatisfying to have a debate about um, design when we haven't very, very clearly uh, specified what the questions are. And, and I think the committee is very well um, you know, equipped to outline what those questions are and, and then perhaps prioritize them. And again, then that will help prioritize the, the various designs. The other thing that became apparent to me as I read this extremely complex literature is how much uncertainty there is in how many domains. And, and we just heard this in the previous panel. Uh, I see a little, can you still hear me? Yes? Yeah, you're there, Steve. Okay, I'm just seeing some uh, uh, s signal here that maybe uh, I'm in, you couldn't. Okay, so the um, there are many, many domains: uh, the extrapolation between species, the penetrance of the disorder, the different clinical manifestations, the relationship between the severity in in, in the mother and, and perhaps in the in the children, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> These it, it seems that what what's need needed is a serious data synthesis effort combined with uncertainty modeling 
to try to formalize the implications of what we know and what we don't know in this area. Otherwise, everybody just keeps tossing up these areas where we don't know this, we don't know that. Um, in fact, in, in each area, we know a little bit, uh, and there has been some uh, study, um, but what we don't know is exactly what the implications of that are for testing and design. And, and the nice thing about these sorts of models <clears throat> is not only do they help provide a formal framework for understanding where the key areas of uncertainty are, but as we do experimentation, we can put these, put the results of the experimentation into the model and, and it can help us formalize the implications of what we learn as, as we learn it. Um, so th this is, none of the questions here <coughs> are the kinds of design questions I, I normally get where the locus of uncertainty is, is really quite narrow. It might be, you know, what, what, is the, what is the frequency of the benefit and what is the frequency of one or two particular harms. Here, th there's the domains of both benefit and harm and even distinguishing between them have many, many, many layers of uncertainty. And, and I think this can only be really captured with sophisticated modeling um, if we're going to go, use, if, if we want to go down the route of clinical testing. Another question that was asked to us <coughs> was the issue of having a uh, control group. Um, I, I think obviously, well, it, it was how to separate intended from unintended consequences, and one can only do that with a control group. Again, which control group you have depends on the question that's being asked. And whenever you talk about a control group, you, you have to bring up the issue of randomization which might seem impossible in this domain. But it may not be impossible to randomize between different ways of doing MRT, again, contingent on the underlying question. So while obviously we almost certainly can't randomize to doing it or not, there are many, many different uh, approaches, and it may be acceptable to randomize among them, and, and that would help a lot. In terms of the size of the studies, again, I have to go back to the question. These could vary by order, many, many orders of magnitude, depending on what the outcome is, depending on how quickly we know it after the procedure is done. If we're talking about fetal or embryonic uh, uh, outcomes versus long-term outcomes, whether we're talking about subtle versus gross uh, abnormalities. So that's really not an answerable question. And the very last thing I'll just mention is the issue of the long-term follow-up and, and what has to happen for that to occur. And maybe Dr. Trumbull, you know, has already been doing this, but long-term follow-up requires registries of some sort. And I know that's very complex in this area, and certainly that introduces the problem of medicalizing the, the children that are born because they have to be followed essentially for life. Um, but registries are often invoked as a solution without adequate thought to what it takes to both set them up for the, the actual me mechanism, the logistics of, of long-term capture. And secondly, the information that needs to be gathered. Sometimes the registry is thought of as simply a sign-up list um, with some uh, contact information. But in fact, they have to be planned with questions in mind because there are many, many registries for many diseases out there that are almost useless because the questions weren't pre-planned and therefore the relevant information was not gathered in real time. So they have to be planned like cohort studies, e even if you don't capture every question that's ever going to be asked. There has to be a minimal data set uh, that, that everybody can decide, agree on going forward. Uh, of course, the logistics of, of capture and, and long-term follow-up is, is also quite complicated. This has been done with many long-term community-based cohort studies, both in the UK and in this country. It's much more complicated here because we don't have the same sort of tracking mechanisms, but it is achievable, albeit with tremendous um, uh, complexity. So in summary, uh, if the community is really ready for clinical studies in this area, uh, we, we need to outline and prioritize the questions that we want to ask and get a consensus as to the order and speed that we can ask them, and, and then the designs follow. 
And finally, we have to think about whether it's possible to, under, to establish the, the kinds of long-term monitoring structures and cohorts that we're going to need to answer some of the most troublesome questions. We might be able to answer the short-term questions um, through you know, traditional randomization between different techniques, but I, I don't think that those are the only ones uh, uh, facing this committee. So um, thinking hard about whether it's possible to do the long-term monitoring and whether the, the, the ethics of initiating a technology like this, if you can't do that, um, I, I think are, is a central question, and I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much.